Now, bleaching is bad for corals. It is a physiological stress. It means they can't grow as fast. They can't reproduce as fast. So it is a problem to the coral physiology. And a bleaching event every year will make it very, very hard for a reef to be sustainable. Now, I've run another little model here where I've run the cyclones together with the bleaching uh, projections and I've used here a sort of conservative IPCC scenario which is a realistic carbon future. And what you can see here is that the combination of cyclones with an intensified strength together with bleaching events with an intensified strength and an intensified frequency, however realistic, will potentially lead to corals having very high mortality at the end of the century. Now, if we go back and look at um, the carbon emissions scheme, and we talked about the climate change effects, remember I mentioned that ocean acidification is like the evil twin of climate change. It is not the physical impact of carbon emissions, it is the chemical consequence. It's fairly almost deterministic in that it's quite, it's quite a precise calculation um, to relate carbon in the atmosphere to carbon in the surface oceans. The consequences of calcification can be quite severe. They're not as dramatic as bleaching and cyclones in the short term, but can potentially lead to a degradation of resilience in the long term. The pathology, or in essence what, what ocean acidification does, it reduces the ability of reefs to to build structures and to repair themselves. That's a problem in a world where storms get more intense. On reefs, on any reef um, today, the building of reefs is a balance between accretion, which is a construction, and destruction or erosion by both physical and biological processes. Now, if we add ocean acidification to that problem, what that means is that the construction gets slowed down. So instead of being a three step forward, one step backwards process, it becomes a one step backwards, two steps, sorry, one step forward, two steps backwards process, which means that ocean acidification can potentially lead to reefs being in a, an erosional state. The problem really of ocean acidification for reefs is that it changes the balance between construction and erosion from being a positive construction to being a positive erosion. Here what I've done is, is modeled that in um, the Kangora principle. And what you can see here, it doesn't affect the disturbances up and down the plank. What it does, it shifts the balance point to the left so that it is easier for the disturbances to basically damage the system. It becomes easier for bleaching to damage the system. It becomes easier for cyclones to damage the system. And it also slows down the recovery, which is critical for a healthy reef. What I've done here is I've shown you, or I'm showing you a model projection where I'm combining cyclones, I'm combining it with bleaching, and I'm also combining it with ocean acidification. And what I've done here is gone quite conservative to say that throughout this century ocean acidification will lead to about 50 percent reduction in coral growth rates. So let, let's see what happens. As you're moving into the century you can see that there is the odd cyclone, then there is an increase in frequency of bleaching events, and as ocean acidification builds up and becomes more and more important and more and more severe, it becomes harder and harder for the corals to recover. What happens in this model, and this is just a model, is by the end, by the, by the third end of the century, we see that we see a rise in algae and a drop in corals. So the model here suggests that we get to a tipping point where ocean acidification, bleaching, and cyclones together will be too much for coral reefs. Now, we've really only talked so far about climate change, ocean acidification, and storms. That's part of the climate change package, or the carbon emissions problem package. Let's have a look at the model if we also think about 
pollution, so nutrient and sediments. If I look out to my right here, I see, I see a reef that has got quite a lot of sedimentation and quite a lot of nutrients. But also remember, it's a lucky reef in that it doesn't see cyclones. So that potentially gives this reef an edge. It has to deal, of course, with pollution and pollution can be a problem. In the context of our model, let's try and see how nutrients and sediment and pollution affects this picture. Now, in the same way as acidification, nutrients and sediments don't affect the disturbances, really. What it does, it changes the, the balance point of the reef. It makes it harder for reefs to recover and it slows down the growth rate, at least for some species of coral, or lots of species of coral. Now, in addition to that, on many reefs, there is a problem of overfishing of herbivores. Remember in the beginning of my talk, I talked about the Great Barrier Reef being wonderful, but also wonderful because it's so well managed in terms of its fishery. So the, the, the busy fish that are eating all the algae are there. So any increase in algae from nutrient pollution and so on are grazed down in many places. In cases where we have the problem of nutrient and sediment pollution occurring together with overfishing, then we start losing control of the things that basically make reefs healthy. Now, this picture looks like Brazil. And some of you might say, hey, this is the, the reefs of Brazil. But it's actually not. This is, this is a reef from Australia. It is right next to the Great Barrier Reef. And I'm showing you this so you don't so you don't stay envious of me of the Great Barrier Reef because there are areas of um, reefs in Australia that also have um, pollution. Some of it is natural sediments and nutrients, and, and Australia has been fighting that problem for a while. Some of those reefs have been accustomed to that through many many years of, of adaptation and acclimation, but at some point when there's additional human-caused runoff and nutrient enrichment, it becomes too much for the corals there as well. And if you can imagine how reefs will respond to climate change, ocean acidification, cyclones, on top of increased pollution, then the problem starts looking really bad. In Queensland, um, there are a very large cattle industry which has caused some erosion of um, the so-called catchments leading into the reefs. Uh, there's also cane farming industry that is, is very well managed and the cane farmers are working together with the managers very well. Nevertheless, there is a problem in retaining the nutrients on the land and some will, will lead on to uh, the reefs. It is a bit of the same problem as, as is occurring here. It, it is a big question whether sediment and nutrients in many cases really is a problem, but the way that we understand it now is that it is potentially a food source in relatively small amounts, but then it gets to a point where there's simply too much, it becomes a stress factor. Here are some pictures for some of the reefs that are the most heavily impacted on the Great Barrier Reef. And you can see here that these reefs have gone beyond um, that point. It has gone into the bad zone of, of what causes, um, what, what reef pollution can cause. The key of the problem is that um, the increase in the macroalgae means that they overgrow the corals. It also means that the nutrients and the sediments potentially become a stress factor directly on the corals. So let's try and go back and have a look at um, what that means in the context of overfishing. If there is a relaxed management on a reef where there is pollution, at the same time there is a pressure on the fishing populations that are keeping down the algae. In some reefs or in some areas when you go traveling in the world and you look for herbivorous fish, you don't see them on the reef, you see them on a plate as I've served to you here. And that is a real problem because each of these parrotfish can keep down, they're basically the local mower man keeping down the grass in a, in a fairly fertile ground. I'm not going to show you a little model and, and this model requires a little bit of explanation. What I'm going through is a bit of a fishing exercise and it has a couple of dimensions so I'll try and explain that to you. What you see on the y-axis where it says frequency going from 0 up to 30 is the 
frequency of the models producing abundance of corals. What you have on the x-axis where it says corals means that that is the actual abundance of corals. So in this particular case, at very low turbidity or serial turbidity, which is very clear water, there is a high probability of the reefs having 80% coral cover. That's a very healthy reef. Lots of coral um, structure giving rise to lots of fish and sustaining lots of species of invertebrates. There is another axis that says turbidity, that is basically a measure of water quality. And it goes from zero up to one, which is, is in my case here, a relatively high um, concentration that is, through published research, demonstrated to be a problem. And what you can see here is that it shifts the corals, the turbidity axis shifts the corals from very high cover down to about 50% cover. So it doesn't necessarily kill the reef, but what it does, it lowers the abundance of corals. You also see there are five fish. So this reef has got lots of parrotfish that are grazing down the algae. So whenever algae grow up, they get nibbled down by fish. Now I'm starting to fish, I'm going fishing. So I've taken away one parrotfish here, and you can see that it has immediately a response on the corals. You see that suddenly up in the high end of the turbidity, you start seeing an increase in the proportion of reefs that have zero corals, which means you start potentially shifting the system into an alternative state. That is the problem of resilience. As we keep fishing, we take away 20% uh, of the, we take away 40% of the fish. We go from five to three here. What you're seeing is here, we have a dangerous increase in the proportion of reefs that have zero corals because the algae basically take over. The fish, even though they're very busy, can't keep down the algae in pace with the growth of the macroalgae. As I keep fishing here, and I fish all the way down to one fish, not true, down to 10% of um, grazing, which means that the fish can only get to 10% of the algae, you basically see a collapse of the system. There is no basis left really for healthy corals because they all get overgrown by algae. 